For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon DeRayhove. I'm speaking with award-winning poet and novelist Ahmed Dango about his latest book titled Strange Pilgrimages. Your recent collection of stories, Strange Pilgrimages, casts an illuminating light on South Africa's struggle years and post-struggle years. What do you believe readers will learn from your characters' journeys? Well, I think, first of all, uh, the South African reader is going to perhaps um, get my message uh, that we are not unique. You know, we South Africans think we are unique and our, our problems are unique and therefore our solutions are unique. We're not. We're probably like many other countries in transition around the world. And so these characters portray the complexity of our lives. You know, nothing is black or white, nothing is absolutely right or wrong, heroes and villains. Uh, lives are far, far more complicated and especially when human beings are involved and people who are in exile um, had to learn to deal with being far away from home and always longing for it and you know so I hope that these stories convey the message that life isn't as simple as we would like our political miracle to make it. One of your characters, Simon Mashaba, who is described as not being good at asking for favours, states that South Africa is now an ordinary nation now that apartheid is gone. Do you share your character's view of South Africa? Well, I hope that... Uh, I don't try to speak personally through the characters. I try to spark a debate. And Simon Mashaba is a South African who lived in exile and then gets posted to New York in the diplomatic service. And he's probably traveled across Africa. And you know, Africans uh, from other parts of the continent always tell us, you South Africans think you're somebody special, you know, not like us. You don't even think you're African. And he was probably trying to say, look, when you go to a place like the United States and you can compete for funding, you have to compete with a whole lot of other African countries. They see you as an ordinary nation and they look at whether it's worth investing there or not worth investing there. Um, and apartheid in many ways gave us a special status. We were an oppressed state, we were in a state of quite unique conflict. It was probably one of the last purely racial conflicts uh, on, the, on the planet. You know, uh, Nazism was gone, uh, the uh, African-American struggles uh, against prejudice, they had largely been uh, won, it was over, and South Africa was the last. So that's gone, and now we have to grapple with the same problems everybody else is grappling with. Another of your characters finds that his lover has been a double agent who has worked for the apartheid security apparatus, but he ends up writing a poem to her and toasting her memory. Do you think such letting go is truly possible? It's difficult if you read the story and the struggles he goes through coming to grips to, uh, with actually understanding who this person was. He knew one person and then he gets this documentation which portrays a completely different person. And he probably asked himself, how didn't I miss that? How didn't I know this? But in the end, he ends up remembering the good things about her. And not only the fact that uh, she was a double agent, she worked with the apartheid government and she was in the underground liberation movement. Um, and he grappled with why she did that. But uh, if I remember the story, it's the one where she asks him to go and put her cat in a secure place. He calls it abandoning it. And that in a sense almost um, portrays her humanity. She didn't just abandon the apartment and the cat she asked someone to take care of it and go and place the cat in a place where um, it would feel at home. So that is her redeeming humanity. And look, no matter how much uh, we hate and how much we've been uh, fearful of people, the lesson we learned from Nelson Mandela is that every human being has some redeeming feature. Certain commentators have described your book as tender and brutally honest. Do you agree? Well, um, I try to be as honest as possible. And so I explore characters and situations without flinching. But I also try to be compassionate about people. You know, I don't want to be judgmental. It's not a fiction writer's role to pass judgments on people. But rather, let those characters live out their complex lives and let the reader judge who's right, who's wrong. Um, as long, I hope that the reader will get that the characters are authentic. 
I hope that is succe I've succeeded in creating authentic characters rather than one-dimensional spokesperson for an author or a viewpoint or an ideology. Um, so yeah, you know, um, I think it was Ariel Dorfman who said that, uh, and he's a very astute person, you know, he's also been in exile and lived abroad for years, and so in a sense I agree with him, yeah. What lessons can South Africans learn from the past in order to have a successful future and happy present? Well, again, I think we must learn the lessons of the past. And uh, one thing we must learn is not to repeat the mistakes of the past. In the past, you had a very hierarchical uh, state, uh, you know, top down as it were, a very powerful president and civil servants that served one person. And we mustn't replicate that. Uh, our democracy must be uh, a little more nuanced. It must take into account the, the differences in our society, you know, not only language and color and religion and culture, uh, but even individuals. And I think the other lesson, as I said earlier on, we really must understand that we South Africans, yeah, we're special, we are all special people, but we're not unique. And I think learning the lessons from the past means that you don't repeat them in the uh, the mistakes uh, in the future. And the one thing that I think we are good at is identifying the problem. And then we say it's someone else's job to uh, solve it. What are we doing to solve the problem? And I think that is one thing. If we're going to have a happy, secure future, f free of poverty and crime, is that every individual must take responsibility. What research did you do on the book? How long did it take you to write and why did you choose to write short stories? Well, let me answer the last question first. I started off writing short stories. My first publication, in fact, was a collection of short stories way, way back in 1978. Uh, I find the short story medium uh, very, very demanding because you have to be concise. You can't stray all over. Uh, a novel gives you some freedom. You know, uh, you can take a character and almost change the character's uh, nuances over the years. But with a uh, short story, you have to be very concise. Nadine Gordimer described it as an egg. You have to keep it intact. You break it, it's meaningless. You know, so it has to be self-contained. I don't think I am as uh, great as Nadine Gordimer in creating that egg. But the short stories for me is a demanding medium, but also a very rewarding one. Now, these short stories I wrote over a number of years, um, you know, even no matter how busy I am, I'm always writing. And short stories is a way of helping me uh, to keep uh, up in touch with my creative self. I am working on a novel. So the, the story started, I started writing these stories in 2001 in New York. Um, and you know, I wrote them over the years. The collection was actually influenced by the publisher, whose editor said he has a thread. So we selected stories that had this thread of uh, the past and the future and memory, um, and how you grapple with the past but forget the future. Research, I think about the only research is that I read a lot. I read un, you know, as many books as I can, and I listen. Uh, you know, it's fascinating for me whether you're in a subway or a tube uh, in London or a subway in New York or a how train in Johannesburg, you hear things. Or sitting on a plane, you hear things, you hear people talk, you hear them say things, you see uh, the way, you know, the, the kind of st uh, uh, stances they take. That teaches me a lot. And so I don't do any kind of formal research except where I have to check the facts. Uh, you know, so around the AIDS issue, I had to make sure I understood exactly what I was saying. I wasn't making assumptions. Um, but that's about the extent of the research. So like any fiction writer, our research is in our imagination. Um, and I use what I see and what I hear, what I interact with. And I hope there's no one in there, no person is going to see in this and say, but that's me, or I said this, you know. Uh, that's happened to me before, by the way. <laughs> that's quite fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> now, who or what influences your writing, both literary and otherwise? Well, as I said, you know, I, I read a lot. 
um, but I'm also conscious of um, what happens to people um, and maybe I've been lucky in my jobs um, you know, for many years I worked in the NGO sector, I worked at the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund which took me into communities, I worked at UNAIDS which really took me into the front line of the human battle of survival and uh, into things like uh, homophobia um, and you know even xenophobia where people were saying immigrants are bringing the AIDS all over the world and then at the Nelson Mandela Foundation again it exposed me to a whole range of, of uh, different people. So in a sense I'm lucky um, that I've been able to uh, gain experience from the work that I've done and then, as I said earlier on I do a lot of reading and, and that influences me. Mm. Mm. Can we expect other books from you in the near future? I'm working on a novel which I've been working on for a number of years. Uh, remember the last novel was published in 2004 which was Bitter Fruit. Um, this one is as complex as Bitter Fruit but it deals with both the past and the present. So it, it basically deals with the story of a, a young woman um, who becomes an uh, underground fighter, leaves the country, comes back uh, and she has a niece who has her name and the niece is a, a journalist who then uncovers a whole lot of corruption and the aunt actually goes and saves the niece from uh, these criminals, you know. So I have to be very careful that I don't kind of create caricatures, you know, it's now a corrupt society, that's not really true. But it's, an, it's really the story of two women from two different generations. And I confess, I grapple with coming or getting into the mind of a woman, you know, how do you think like a woman, how do you react, not that women and men think differently, but there are human responses. And I'm very grateful to my wife and my daughter and, you know, people that I know that help me understand, uh, well, you know, uh, in a situation like this, that's what a man would do, you know, be macho about it, mm -hmm. and not a woman, she would do things differently. I hope to finish the novel by the end of the year and then offer it to my publisher by next year. Thank you for your time. That was poet and novelist Ahmed Dango speaking about his collection of short stories titled Strange Pilgrimages.